Hi, I'm here today with Suresh Naidu, who is Assistant Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He's also an INET grantee doing research on slavery as a property right and its economic issues for thinking about property in the United States. Welcome. Thanks. Could you give us more information about what your research is about and why it should be interesting to uh, economists? Okay, so economists, and particularly in the literature I work in, which is the political economy of development and institutions, think that sort of some of the most ins important institutions are those around property rights, and that security of property rights is in fact one of the most important institutions for securing economic growth. So in my INET grant with Jeremiah Dittmar, we're looking at, in fact, a very peculiar set of property rights, which were the property rights in people, and that's slavery. And that's particularly in the US context, where a number of historians have made the argument that, in fact, the political constituency behind the US's unusual commitment to strong property rights wasn't, in fact, the Puritans of Massachusetts. It was the slave owners of Virginia and that the people that were really concerned about securing the right to property were concerned about not property rights in land, but property rights in people. And so what we're trying to do is think about slavery as a system of property. So what, what kind of data are you looking at to analyze this, and what, what are your hypotheses in dealing with that data? W one hypothesis is essentially in places where slave, uh, property rights in slaves were weak, that in fact you saw a little bit more investment in manufacturing and a little bit more efficiency in manufacturing, as well as uh, more, more willingness to invest in actually public infrastructure like bridges and, and things like that. One of the ideas behind the latter is that some economic historians have suggested that judges that were less likely to respect slave property rights were actually might have been more, in a relative sense, more sympathetic to arguments uh, around eminent domain. And so this ability to take a port and develop it in the public interest might have been stronger where you were sort of willing to, to less willing to respect the property rights period, you might have been more willing to do eminent domain. And then the manufacturing thing is fairly simple. It's that if property rights in slaves are less secure, that induces very uh, agents, investors, to move their money into manufacturing, and then a lot of models where there's learning by doing or externalities in the manufacturing sector that should suggest additional investment and additional productivity in the manufacturing sector. And how, how many states, how many counties, what, what is the detail of the data that you'll have on this? So think? the data on the judges involves collecting all these judicial opinions for, uh, that had anything to do with slavery in the pre-Civil pre War period and then scoring each judge on their degree of sympathy to slave property rights. And largely, so far, the data we've been able to get has been state supreme courts and federal district courts um, are, is what we're looking at. And then on the fugitives, what we're doing uh, that I think is actually pretty exciting is finally putting together like a very comprehensive list of runaway ads from newspapers in the 19th century from 1860 to 1840. And so that's going to be every newspaper in this newspaper database, and we've been trawling it uh, with a computer to basically pull out all of, the, all of the things that look like runaway ads and then individually coding them. So I think we'll have something like the biggest database of, of fugitive of runaway ads that, that have been put together for this period. Let's talk so. about your, your early education. and how, when, how did you get interested in economics as a general topic? So when, when you're not in economics, you think of economics as kind of uh, very conservative. And then it was actually through philosophy classes that I discovered that there was actually an entire group of economists that were interested in thinking about issues of like economic justice and redistribution and thinking about them formally. So I was a double major. I was, started out in computer science and wound up ma majoring in pure math. And so this idea of being able to use these technical tools to think about issues of, of justice and redistribution was, was really appealing to me. And particularly when I went in, as I was a participant in the 1999 Seattle demonstrations and sort of then got swept up in, in that line, and I decided that it was important that there be more economists and people trained in economics of my generation that knew this, uh, that were sort of in the public debate. That intellectual influence and then that sort of political influence together sort of made me decide to go to economics. And the only place I really, really wanted to go was the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. 
So you went to the University of Massachusetts in their graduate program in economics? Yes, and uh, having only taken one economics class, and that was on the history of economic thought. And then I, on the encouragement of my advisors, Herb Gentis and Sam Bowles, they were suggesting that, that actually I would benefit from training at a mainstream department. And so I tried that out as a visiting student at Harvard for a semester in 2003. And like that enough that I decided the next year I was going to apply to transfer, I transferred, I got admitted to Berkeley, and then I spent uh, that sort of a large chunk of that year at the Santa Fe Institute as a graduate fellow. And so, uh, and then I went to Berkeley. So how was your experience at Santa Fe? You need to talk a lot with physicists and biologists and computer scientists, and at some level, the only way you can really talk with them is at the level of metaphors or at the level of literally using the fact that you're using similar math. And so there's either very high level conversations that you can have sort of very abstractly, or the very concrete, I need to solve this kind of problem. You guys know how to solve it, how do I solve it? But then it's also, there's people there that just have no sort of respect for the economics conventions. And so you wind up coming to economics with the sense that you can't take this stuff for granted. There's a lot of really smart people out there that think this stuff is kind of, you know, <laughs> needs to be justified. Uh, and so and that so, helps. So then Berkeley, what was your experience at Berkeley? <clears throat> how so, did that differ from other places? Prior to coming to Berkeley, I was very skeptical of econometrics and very skeptical about uh, applied work being useful. And then at Berkeley, through like Ken Che's class, through uh, classes in labor economics there, I sort of, and particularly, you know, the influence of other students, I think, I sort of came around to the idea that actually the most important thing to do in economics is just establish facts. <laughs> and, uh, and then in the ideas part of it, I mean, I was just influenced by strong economic historians at Berkeley. So I talked a lot with Brad DeLong, and then my, the people that wound up being my advisors were like Pranab Bardon and, and Gerard Roland. After, after UMass and, and Santa Fe, I felt like I sort of knew what I wanted to, what kinds of questions I wanted to look at, and I really think about Berkeley as setting me up with these applied empirical tools. Well, great, well, we welcome you to the INET community and, great. and look forward to seeing your uh, research from the grant that we're funding. Okay, great, thank you so much.